It was all right. So I'm on. Beginning? Yep, whenever you're ready. All right. Well, um, our, our country's history has a long and serious problem with uh, discrimination, obviously. And um, just going all the way back to say, I mean, most prominently the Civil War. I mean, a quote by Justice, Supreme Court Justice, uh, Clarence Thomas on the issue, talking about the Equal Protection Clause of uh, 14th Amendment was purchased at the price of immeasurable human suffering. The Equal Protection Clause reflects our nation's um, understanding that such classifications have a destructive impact on the individual and our society. So, what I want to talk to you about today is the unfortunate reality that we're still living with, that uh, programs like affirmative action are, in, in their practice today, fundamentally still discriminatory. So, I'm going to go about trying to prove that point to you with three uh, main arguments. First, the current affirmative action programs still favor particular races and particular genders. It's sort of neutral, and I'll explain why that is in a second. Um, the college admissions, secondly, are like jobs, while the terminology of zero-sum game is sort of problematic. Fundamentally, they are what are called zero-sum games. And third, that affirmative action at a base level sort of negates the very merit of an educational institution. So, first, um, affirmative action programs still favor particular races or genders. What we're dealing with is a variety of legal cases that have been going like, I think it's Bach EV, this or that, it's for legal stuff, there's like lots of specific cases, but um, Grutter v. Bollinger, most recently I believe it was Fisher versus University of Texas, like just three years ago now, because it's 2019, so we're trying to get used to that. Um, just two years ago in 2016, the courts ruled that yes, the actions of the University of Texas are legal in um, using race-conscious admissions. The, sp the specifics of it can really, I mean, I could just go for probably half an hour, so I'll probably cut that short, but um, to, to, um, quote um, Justice Samuel Alito on this topic, sort of a dramatic quote, I thought it was rather nice, um, racial balancing is not transformed from patently unconstitutional to compelling state interests um, simply by relabeling it racial diversity. One of the real big issues with affirmative action is the desire or the need to confront and overcome previous um, discriminations and previous un injustices that have occurred in the past, but what has ended up happening is these programs have, I mean, from their basis they were discriminatory, and to this day they continue to be, and that's something that we try to overlook, but fundamentally that is discriminatory. And the reason that this is a problem at all is because, like I was saying back to the 14th Amendment, it's unconstitutional. It's something that is not to be. So, as to my second point, because I think I have all that, da, 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 da. oh no, all right. So, what really makes this issue sort of so strange is that, as I was looking into it more, what I uncovered is, not only is it a, not only is the system tradition, like the traditional system of benefiting um, ethnic and gender minorities and bringing down ooh, straight white men like me. Ooh. Um, what has actually happened, thanks to research I found from the Washington Post article by a guy by the name of Nick Anderson, back from research he did on federal data in 2014, was that of about 128 or so prominent universities, about 64 of them since 1975, since 1979 or so, women have been attending colleges more than men. About half of these institutions actually will favor men in in the admissions of their programs. So it's it's got to the point where it's much more about trying to just create what Alito calls racial balancing more than actually trying to correct certain past injustices. It's about trying to get what I believe these cases call a critical mass of students over trying to really create, I suppose, a just merit-based system. 
So on to my second point. College admissions, like employment opportunities, are fundamentally a zero-sum game. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard that term before, and there is some contention to using that, but it's fundamentally the idea, I'm sure plenty of people here have jobs or have applied for jobs, but you can't get a certain position in a job without someone else potentially who wanted that job not getting it. So what's the problem with that? Well, if you're admitted into a college based on traits about you, your race, your gender, your sexuality, if you're admitted into that um, college or that job based on those traits, then implicitly other people are not admitted because of their traits. It doesn't have to be the definitive process. Current, administ current um, admissions policies, again, because of all these legal changes that have gone over, um, on over the years, the current admission policies are typically what's referred to as a holistic process, where there would be a variety of different um, traits. They're trying to establish what you've done, what, what are the benefits of you as an individual, how have you contributed to the community, all this and that. And so th there's a variety of different stuff in there, but fundamentally, if you're looking at yourself as an individual or any organization that is hiring you as an individual, if they're, if they're admitting you based on your traits in any way, then you're denying others based on their traits implicitly. That's just what's going on. So da, 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 moving on to my third point, all right? Moving on to my third point is just fundamentally race, uh, using race or using gender or using sexuality in admissions is just patently denying the merit of an applicant. Like what's, what's so weird about considering these things is that on the one hand, you are taking into account someone's individuality. You're taking account of what makes them how they are. They were born a certain way. You can't really change that. Yep. You can't really change that. But what's interesting is that right on the opposite face of that, by admitting people based on, by admitting people or implicitly not based on their traits, you're actually denying their individuality by considering them just part of a group, not who they are. It's oh, well, you happen to be represented, overrepresented, or underrepresented based on what category you happen to be born into. And this is debate based on what university. It can be any group of people. I mean, even right now, I believe most recently, there was a Harvard hearing going on where Asian students have been trying to clamor that Harvard is using racial discrimination in, against Asians in their, in their admissions practices. And that's still a case going on today. So. In conclusion, like I said, it's, there is still fundamentally admissions that are based on people's race or gender. This is implicitly denying certain people by admitting others. And finally, it's just denying people's merit. So, yeah, my main claim again, um, administration, admit, uh, affirmative action in college admissions is fundamentally discrimination. Thank you. As I've said before, it's rarely a problem of filling the time. It's trying to get things down into the amount of time that happened. You probably are aware that you were two and a half minutes over. So basically, you had more than a 35%, 37% excess amount of time. You want to be careful about that. The proposition is clearly stated at the beginning of the speech. I think you have a good preview of what the contents are. You need to pace yourself a little bit more. I, I appreciate the casual delivery style, but you also have to have a sense of uh, urgency in the presentation, especially when you have so much content that you're going to have to explain along the way. Uh, the, I like the fact that you have the quotes from the two uh, justices, but those quotes are rarely being applied in the particular way that uh, you want us to get them in judging, for instance, a, a particular affirmative action policy. I think the one thing that's missing from this argument is a demonstration that these colleges and universities are, in fact, doing the things that you're talking about. You had one place where you said, um, 
you know, uh, 64 of the colleges in this one study, half the colleges in this one study, basically favor men in admissions. That's the closest we get to anything that specifies what kind of um, affirmative action is going on. And it's pretty ambiguous as to what it is they're looking for. How do they favor men? And how does it manage to pass muster with the uh, courts? That's the thing that I think where there's controversy. You're suggesting that the courts are allowing these things to go on and that in essence they violate the Constitution. So uh, if they get, are getting away with it, then there's got to be a policy that you can point to that's going to be a lot clearer. Uh, you kind of have some generic examples, uh, mentioning Baki and the University of Texas case, uh, without necessarily talking about what the particulars of those are. Baki is a 40-year-old case, and uh, the UT Tech case is apparently a shorter period of time, but I still don't know what happened at the University of Texas. At the end, you make a reference to some vague criticism among Asian American students uh, against Harvard University. I think you need more of this information earlier in the speech. The body of the speech is signposted. By the way, you get to your second point five minutes into the speech. I started watching your time at that point, and I realized this is going to be, you know, a, an issue. So, uh, you, you know, you, with only a minute to go, that's when you got to the second point. So two of your points are going to be in overtime. The third point is completely in overtime. The second one is mostly in overtime. Uh, so that's a little bit of a problem. Uh, like I said, I think you need some more specific data on cases uh, and uh, court rulings, uh, some more specific data about the kinds of policies that colleges and universities are pursuing that violate these rules. Uh, there's a lot of generic explanation about why these points matter. Um, but we also need to see that this is, in fact, uh, happening. And I think that that's you know, that needs more data. All right, I got to stop because we got.